Hello, welcome. I wanted to make a few remarks on my recent conversation with John Verveke and Johannes Niederhauser. For anyone who hasn't watched it yet, they should check it out, definitely. It's a very interesting conversation and probably the most intense uh, and important one I've done so far. And there are certain points that I didn't get to fully discuss or certain points I couldn't fully flesh out my argument. And I'd just like to uh, go through some of these points, show you what was said and explain my position in these moments. Now, the first one is talking about the limitations and the trade-offs in AI development. And here, John and I, we talk about uh, the visual systems. So, for example, convolutional neural networks that can take a picture as an input and will tell you what's in that picture. Now, there's such a thing as adversarial data sets or adversarial examples uh, that are also used in adversarial networks where you take pictures and manipulate them in a way that they are no longer recognized as what they are meant to be recognized as. So a human may see a penguin and recognize it as such, and the system may recognize it as a penguin, and you may add a minute kind of noise to the image, something you can't even notice, so a human would still see a penguin, but the system will think it's something else, a school, a bus, or something. and that kind of is an example I use to show that whatever that system is doing, even to get correct results, is it's not seeing, it's not doing this, it's not recognizing an object the same way a human would. It's recognizing it some way, but not the way a human would. And uh, John takes the point and agrees to this in this part here. But first of all, I want to first of all re reinforce your first point, which is yeah, you get the machine, it's, it, it does as good as human beings, penguin. And then you you scatter into it imperceptible static. You turn off some yeah. of the pixels, and it'll go from penguin. That's a school bus, right? right? So it makes mistakes we don't make. But that that's not just perceptual. It's also at the level of cognition. So I don't know if you've heard about it. It's, you know, Stuart Russell. So he uh, takes my point here. However, towards the end of the conversation, he makes an argument towards Johannes when Johannes claims that they are programmed with that language models, for example, are programmed with language, where he claims the following. They weren't programmed with language. That's not what happened. They were given a learning ability so that they were yeah. given reinforcement learning. So they learned language like the way you learn language. Now, they don't have full meaning. I acknowledge that. But I think it is, I think relying on the idea that they are machines like a tractor that we built, that's not, a, that's not, I think, a fair analogy. So the problem here is uh, he's correct in that uh, we are not using a particular explicit language model such as some sort of parsing grammar or some sort of uh, theory of language that is built into the program. It is true that a language model or the current large language models, they kind of get basic rules and then the language knowledge, quote unquote, uh, emerges on itself after inputting a large amount of data into it. But he claims here that they learn language the way you do it, the way we do it. And that kind of contradicts the claim earlier where he recognizes that um, these systems don't see the way we do. And in the same way, they also don't learn language the way we do. So a child that learns a language is not presented with 200 gigabytes of masses of text and then recognizes all of the statistical correlations between their occurrences and their contexts. contexts. Uh, also, language is not text-based uh, in human development and human language learning. Um, so in no way do we learn language the way these models learn language. Humans learn it specifically foremost first verbally and in interaction and in interplay. And the thing is, I'm not going to uh, strawman him uh, here. John, I think, is very aware of that. This could have been just some minor uh, sleight of hand, or not sleight of hand, a minor kind of uh, mistake uh, on his part. Uh, but another point that I want to address, and that is kind of the overarching point uh, I think he's trying to make, uh, other than even if he recognizes that it's not exactly how we learn language, his overarching point is that we haven't explicitly programmed 
the language capabilities into the language models, it has emerged after training, right? And uh, that is a kind of an indication of a step forward in a way, a step forward where these um, abilities now no longer are explicitly built by us, but they kind of emerge on their own. So we've kind of made a step towards autopoiesis, towards self-organization of technical systems. Uh, now, to some extent, that is true. To another extent, one could make an argument in the exact opposite direction. Namely, if you look at the uh, debates surrounding the origin of, of languages, there was a paradigm originally that was referred to as behaviorism. Now, behaviorism um, contains a lot of different aspects, uh, has a lot of different uh, areas that it's applied to. Uh, however, just specifically, just to simplify it, we look at it as a system, empirical system or experimental system that kind of shows that you can train certain properties uh, to an organism via reward and punishment. So via rewarding if something is done correctly and punishing when something's done incorrectly. And it was assumed that language emerged that way, that positive use or correct use of language was reinforced by, by the surroundings, by the family, and negative wrong usage incorrect language was punished by slight punishments like you know saying it's incorrect or incomprehensible or slight cues now uh, it was shown by the likes of noam chomsky that that does not properly model how humans learn language there's many reasons for that uh, one of which being uh, the fact that it's generative uh, very early on children start developing their own sentences their own uh, structures that may be completely original uh, without having to have learned or ever been trained with all of these combinations. And uh, in that way, you can see that what we've done with large language models is kind of using the power of computation um, in order to apply a sort of mass behaviorist training. So you have positive training data uh, often in neural networks, that's how it works. You have training data that's labeled. And um, with language models, there's different ways of training them, but one of which would be having correctly structured sentences and the other one having incorrectly structured sentences. Now, different language models have different methods of doing it, but the underlying uh, structure of the process, I would argue, is behaviorist, namely that you try and fine tune the model via behaviorist cues of saying this is a correct use of language, this is an incorrect use of language. And that system uh, can reconstruct or at least give a, a convincing um, performance of language uh, because it, we are capable of the power of computation of training it a very, with a very, very large data set of language, uh, a data set much larger than anything a human may ever read or even speak, right? So whilst it was shown a child cannot learn language that way, uh, this system seems to be able to um, kind of learn or train or figure out, compute the statistical weights between words, sentences, uh, configurations of word tokens. Uh, however, it means that we've kind of gone back to behaviorism in our way of modeling language. Now, in a way, that means uh, to some extent that you could see it, that language kind of emerged in that model in a positive light, but you could also see it in the other way, that this model doesn't even have a basic understanding of language, not even a fundamental, very basic model of language is built into this uh, it's the opposite you could train this system on almost any type of data it doesn't even have to be language um, you know sometimes you have to be careful about seeing a universal applicability and seeing it as some sign of a greater intelligence or general intelligence or it's maybe just a statistical template that doesn't actually incorporate much of the fundamental knowledge of a particular real life phenomenon you're trying to model with that data. Now, moving on to my final point, 
and that is one that was made towards the end in that conversation. And that is the idea that these models could eventually um, become independent of training data that is provided by human behavior and human learning. They could at some point train themselves. And whilst uh, I'm open to hearing an argument of how this is possible, I haven't been convinced in hearing in, in, by the arguments that I've heard so far. Uh, because I do not see how we could construct something that evades its own rules of construction. Um, now, I was accused of using a secret sauce argument where I'm claiming humans are in some way special without justifying that claim, and thus machines could never reach our level. But I mean it almost in an opposite way, where we are, because of our perspective limitation of our perspective of as a human we are not capable of fully understanding our rules of behavior and implementing them our rules of behavior evade us and so we cannot capture them in order to build them into a machine it's a lack on our part to be able to build such a thing that may evade and transcend its own rules and his argument against that was that we as humans have also sprung from Neanderthals or Homo heidelbergensis, whatever example you use. We have sprung from them and they no longer exist. So the same could happen with machines. Now, I want to explain why that's a false analogy, analogy a bit uh, further than I did in the conversation, but I'll show you the clip for a second. At some point, you know, this will kind of be able to re-separate into a separate machine and just go on without us that's implying a magic like we did things. with hydro homo hydroborgensis we emerged out of them and they disappeared you keep using machine examples and i keep asking you to think of biological examples it, right it is clearly the case right but they didn't build us that's the crucial point i didn't get further than this saying they didn't build us um, but I, that's exactly the point i would say the Analogy is false in that sense that the reproductive mechanism that we use to have children or that Neanderthals used uh, is not something that we have constructed. It is something that was that was there all along, even before there was human consciousness, even before we could reflect on it. We were able to reproduce, and animals can. The difference, I would say, is that what he, machines should be analogous to in nature is the so-called extended phenotype that Richard Dawkins talked about. Now the extended phenotype is something that is relevant towards natural selection, it's relevant to the survival and fitness of a particular species, but it is not directly attached to the physical biological organism of that entity. There's some famous examples that he cites. There's the cathedral termite that builds these fascinating nests. You've got beaver dams, a very common example. Um, but there's also more uh, tricky, complex uh, examples that use um, parasitism between organisms. Now, I think that would be a more apt uh, analogy in nature um, of uh, when talking about machines in humans, where I would say techniques and machines could be more compared to the extended phenotype of humans. And here in nature, you cannot find an example of how these extended phenotypes would reproduce without their original host organism. Like, for example, a beaver dam reproducing itself without the beavers anymore. It may stay for some while, but it may not reproduce itself. In the same way, the machines may reconstruct themselves and rebuild themselves for a while after humans are gone, but there's no reason to assume that after a certain time they will still behave and act according to human rationality and intelligence and behavior and not fully depart at some point and be not recognizable anymore. In the same way, we cannot really depart and be live independently from the nat natural biological necessities and systems we emerged from. At some point, uh, living in some isolated technical capsule that will replace nature for us will also have us uh, deviate and depart from 
anything resembling humans originally. I hope the argument kind of made sense. Uh, and I'm saying I would still be open to a, an argument for this sort of machine runaway. Just the analogies that were used were not adequate in my estimation. And the more adequate analogies do not provide for an argument for this kind of machine development. So I hope this was insightful. Like and subscribe. And if you haven't signed up yet, this Sunday, 14th of May, the Philosophy of the Machine course will be beginning on Halkion Guild. And anyone interested in the meaning and the position that technics and the machine has in our society nowadays should definitely sign up. It's going to be very important and impactful and we are going to explore a lot of interesting topics and I hope to see you there. Take care.